The House Committee on State Affairs will now come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Patty. Present. Vice Chair Hernandez. Rep. Smithy. Here. Rep. Raymond. Here. Rep. Deshotel. Here. Rep. Phil King. Here. Rep. Hunter. Here. Rep. Howard. Here. Rep. Lucio III. Rep. Metcalf. Here. Rep. Shaheen. Rep. Harless. Here. Rep. Slauson. Here. The quorum is present. Good morning, members. Uh, as a reminder to all who plan to testify, please ensure that you have registered through the electronic witness affirmation system located on the tablets and hallways throughout the extension. Uh, well, here as well. If you're having trouble registering, please see uh, my assistant clerk, uh, Marco Fuentes. He will assist you. Please also remember that when you testify in front of our committee, you're testifying under oath and are required to testify fully and truthfully. For all in attendance today, we're observing safe social distancing. Masks are required by all individuals in attendance today unless you're testifying. Members on the dais are separated by plexiglass and as such may use their discretion regarding mask wearing. Today's hearing is also being live streamed on the House website, www.house.texas.gov forward slash video dash audio. Additionally, pursuant to House Rule 4, Section 20B and the standard electronic public comment process established by the Committee on House Administration. All public comments submitted through the portal will be posted on TLS, TLO, and the House website after the comment period is closed. Directions of how to submit public comments on the portal can be found on today's hearing notice. The public comments portal uh, have been open since uh, Friday, March 12th, and will close upon adjournment of this hearing. Members, as mentioned during last week's hearing, it is my intention to bring forth testimony today to provide this committee with a forum to discuss and understand the complexities regarding the repricing issue being considered by the legislature and PUC. It's my hope today's witnesses will shed light on the realities, possible implications, and many unknowns related to repricing our electricity market after the fact. With that, members, uh, we'll begin testimony. Unless we have no other announcements, right? Hmm? All right. Uh, we'll first hear from I IMM, Ms. Bivens. And certainly you know the uh, drill. If you would state your name and who you represent. Yes, and, and if you don't mind, I have a short statement as well. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Patty and representatives of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these important matters with you today. My name is Carrie Bivens, and I work for Potomac Economics as VP and ERCOT IMM Director. We were selected by the Public Utility Commission to act as the Wholesale Electric Market Monitor pursuant to the Public Utility Regulatory Act. We've been serving in this role of Independent Market Monitor for ERCOT since the role was established in 2006. Our firm serves as the monitor for multiple electricity markets throughout the U.S. And in the ERCOT region, we operate under the supervision and oversight of the PUC, and the Commission retains all enforcement authority. The IMM refers matters to the PUC, such as violations of Commission rules or ERCOT protocols for potential enforcement. We recognize that this was an extraordinary event requiring difficult decisions to be made. I'd like to personally thank the dedicated people at ERCOT and across the utility industry for keeping the grid protected from blackout conditions. <clears throat> Nothing I discuss today should be construed to mean that these choices are simple or to distract from the hardships endured by Texans during this difficult event. Economically efficient prices must reflect actual supply and actual demand. And departing from this fundamental principle erodes the integrity of the market. We believe the decision to extend the pricing intervention that raised prices to $9,000 per megawatt hour after the end of firm load shed resulted in overpriced energy in ERCOT's real-time market by $16 billion. Because a substantial share of demand is served by owned generation or forward contracts, the settlement amounts differ from this total value, including only transactions that are settled by ERCOT, and if we bring it up to the corporate level on a net basis, this will result in changes in settlements of $4.2 billion. Of that, $1 billion represents an uplift amount for reserves. Next, we've also recommended that ancillary services be capped at $9,000 for hours in which the price exceeded this amount, sometimes by over two and a half times. Ancillary services are generally operating reserves held aside 
to provide additional supply to satisfy energy demand when unforeseen events occur. Nothing in ERCOT's protocols or commission rules expressly endorses the idea that pricing shortages of operating reserves higher than the shortages of energy, and it is economically inconsistent to do so. The net effect of this correction, accounting again for offsetting effects at the corporate level, is $900 million. We recognize that certain futures markets are derived from ERCOT real-time prices. As time passes, many of these future products have now settled against the original inflated real-time prices, which increases the unintended consequences of correcting those prices. These downstream impacts are almost entirely related to the energy imbalance resettlement. It is the portion of the pricing error that was the most, well, that was likely the most well hedged by the ERCOT participants and the most complicated to unwind. Finally, although the other two components of the corrections, the ones related to the reserve payments, are smaller, it can be argued that these errors are more harmful because they produce costs that are difficult or impossible to hedge. While at this level, suspending the reserve uplift or capping ancillary service prices is a clearer choice, we stand by all of our recommendations. I'll conclude by thanking you again for the opportunity to be part of the proceeding, and I'm prepared to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Bivens. Um, I'll have some questions, but I'm going to defer the members first. Members, questions for Ms. Bivens? Chair, sure, recognize Mr. King. Thank you. And uh, I watched your testimony in the Senate and thought it was really, really well laid out the other day. Thank you. So could you explain and help me understand the RUC process? Yes. So it's called Reliability Unit Commitment. And the market design is such that market participants are encouraged to make their own judgments about whether or not to actually run their generator that day based on what they think the conditions are going to be. And so there is a, um, a day ahead market, a futures market that's actually at ERCOT that is there to also help with folks making those decisions. So we want the generators to make the economic commitment themselves so that they take on all the benefits and the risks thereof. If that doesn't work, there's a backstop, a reliability backstop, that says, okay, we let the market make its choices. It wasn't sufficient to meet our reliability needs. And so as the ERCOT operator can decide that those reliability needs mean that they need to go and issue an instruction, you generator XYZ need to be on for these hours tomorrow. So normally the hope is that the market itself, the pricing, whatever it is on the real-time market, for example, will incentivize a generator to turn on. Yes. But if they don't, then the ERCOT manager has the authority to say, uh, generation unit one, company one, uh, come online. And then they reconcile that later based on that generator uh, sending in their, showing their costs and, and they receive funding based on what those actual costs were. Mm -hmm. So, so let's say that the real time market was, was going at $2,500. And let's say that someone who comes in under RUC shows their cost being 1500 for that same increment, incremental period. Do they get reimbursed? Is the settlement for 1500? or is it for what the stack was at that moment? So there's what's called a RUC guarantee. The guarantee says that whatever you offer in, and there's, um, there's multiple components to that, is that um, you know, there's a particular component just for starting up. There's a component for running at your minimum level, which can be less efficient than running normally. And then there's just an offer curve. So there's three parts. And it says that you're guaranteed to at least make the revenue to cover these three parts of your offer. And if you don't, then we will make you whole to that. So, so let's go back to Sunday night, Monday morning. Um, the, the market that's in place, the incentives to try to get people to come online and to get people to shed load, the industrial load, that's based on, wow, the prices are $9,000 a megawatt. And so I want to get in there and turn my, but that always assumes that a generator is able to turn on. In other words, that whole market model, the pricing model that the PUC and ERCOT was using during the, during the crisis 
was based on a model that presumes that generation is going to be available to bid in, to come in, to come online, right? Well, I would say that it assumes that the supply should equal the demand. And that, and that supply is available. And in other words, there's things sitting in reserve that can come online when they're incented by higher prices. Yes. I'm sorry, just one second. Let the record show that uh, Mr. Lucille is present. Sorry about that. Sure. Um, so to the extent that demand was not being served, demand should set the price. Because there was demand that was not being served and the value of that has been pegged at $9,000. And so when demand is not being served because of the actions of the ERCOT operator, then the price should reflect to the value of that loss load, which is $9,000. Got that. That is supposed to encourage generators to come on. It's also to encourage demand that can come off to do so as well. And, and I guess that's why, I'm, I'm kind because of, it seems like we were using a pricing model that was designed for a normal day when demand's high, maybe it's 110 degrees or, you know, we've got a long cold stretch and generators are available to come online. Whereas in this case, it seems like the model they tried to put in place that set all the pricing wasn't designed for an emergency situation like we had that night where you didn't have generation available. Am, am I thinking through that wrong? Let, let the record show that uh, Vice Chair Hernandez is present. I apologize again. Sure. Uh, I would take a longer view and say that the energy only market design is designed so that when there is scarcity, that the scarcity gets priced in. And, but during the rest of the time, prices are very, you know, highly competitive, very, typically very low. Yeah. And you can go years without recovering any of your fixed cost. And so the incentive is not just in the short duration of the event, it's also in the market design that says that if you want to make your, their money, if you want to make any of your fixed costs back, you better be ready and available during the scarcity event. And so there's kind of a long-term signal that goes along with the also the short term. It says make sure you're winterized so you're available to come online and, and that type of thing. And have, and have yes. energy available, have fuel. So, and I'm not suggesting a capacity market or anything like that. I'm just, I'm wondering why in an emergency situation like that, where you've got, why, am, am I correct that the, some of the testimony we've had over the last couple of weeks, I'm losing track, didn't someone, wasn't it discussed whether it should have been the RUC process used to bring generation online as opposed to the the nine thousand dollar pricing cap i'm not sure if that was discussed in testimony but i think it was at least discussed during these hours that we're recommending that the price should not have been nine thousand dollars is that rock could have been a tool to use during that time and and so my question is does ERCOT have the statutory authority they need in a situation like that to which is going to be rare, but do they have the statutory authority they, they need to say, hey, we're not going to go under the normal pricing model. We're going to try to bring everybody we can online with RUC. Because they can order them. They can say, you can come online whether you want to or not, and we're going to compensate you based on RUC, because they do that all the time. Correct? They do that all the time. Do they have the statutory authority to just make a decision in a crisis like this that, hey, we're just going to bring everybody online with RUC, and use that as a method to hold the extraordinary pricing down. So during the duration of the commission order, which was during firm load shed, the price was directed to be $9,000. So in that case, they were doing what they were directed. But let's, let's pretend they hadn't done that and oh, they just okay. ordered everybody to come online and said, we'll, we, we'll, we'll settle this up through RUC. Because one of the things it seems like it's easier to do is in an emergency like that, it's so much harder to go after the fact and bring prices back down mm -hmm. as opposed to after the fact settling up and paying you up for it as to what your actual costs were in an emergency. And so it seems like I remember them talking about they discussed whether they would do it that way or by raising price. And, and my question is, if they, if they had made the decision to just do everything with RUC, we wouldn't be talking about clawbacks now, we'd be talking about settling up going forward for actual costs yes. and whatever those costs with profit might be and those costs get uplifted to load. Right, and they get uplifted going forward, which would be a little bit easier. But the, the question, somebody suggested to me that they may not have the statutory authority they need in, in, in Pura to, to actually make that kind of decision in an emergency. Because I'm looking at this thing that happened this storm 
it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the pricing model we have in place didn't fit the type of emergency we had. And they went out and tried to use the traditional pricing incentives to get everybody online. Well, anybody could come online was trying to come online because they were ordered to come online. And so it seems like we wouldn't be in this situation if they had done it all under RUG. As opposed, we'd, we'd, instead we'd be looking at what do we owe you for what you did do for came, for what you came online for instead of trying to claw all this stuff back. So an important distinction too, I just want to point out is that when they, so they try not to use RUG because it's an out of market action, is that the design is to let the market work. So if they use this reliability unit commitment, the, um, there's a pricing run that will determine what the price would have been if they hadn't taken that action. So it's fairly likely that the prices would have been high anyway because it's an out of market action. That action is removed and determined what the price would have been without it. And, and that's what's printed as well. So you could have both uplift payments and high prices. It's, that's entirely possible. Does there need to be a different structure that's available when there's an emergency declared? Yes, I think going forward, I think that needs to be discussed. So the PUC and its rules already has what people commonly are to refer to as a circuit breaker that, um, you know, and I'm not saying whether or not Potomac Economics endorses the idea of the circuit breaker. I just wanted to point out that it exists. And what happened was that circuit breaker included, um, so it says like, you know, after a certain amount of revenue has been generated, um, kind of a proxy for fixed costs, then let's reduce the, um, the cap from 9,000 to 2,000. But it also has a fuel index multiplier. And nobody ever envisioned price, fuel prices being $380. So if you take that multiplier by $380, then the price would have been $18,000. And that wasn't what anybody envisioned because that's above the value of loss load. So that's something that the commission is already working on. They've opened a rulemaking to determine how to address that issue because in such an extraordinary event, it, it had not been anticipated that prices that are normally, you know, two or three dollars, that maybe in a, an emergency event would be, you know, three or four times that would go hundred times that. So would you envision something that says when an emergency is declared by some authority that there's a different, different model that the that the ERCOT operators operates under for the duration of that emergency? That's not what I'm envisioning, but that might come out of the rulemaking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Members. Ms. Howard. Sorry, I'm trying to find these buttons here. Um, just want to follow up on a few things that uh, Representative King was talking about. But for, first, um, you referred to this as a pricing error. And I'd like to have you explain to me how that's an appropriate word for what happened here. I think those of us that are trying to figure this out are trying to get to what the facts actually are here mm -hmm. and recognizing that there are rules in place that are supposed to be followed and that the market is based on having consistency and reliability in rules. Um, there's probably some parsing of words within the rules I'm, I'm imagining. I'm not sure, but, um, but we keep going back to the concept of whether or not there was actually an error made or if it was a judgment call. And so I'd like for you to explain to me the, the fact that you used pricing error and what you meant by that. So we read the commission order as saying that, you know, to the extent ERCOT is taking an out-of-market action, which it is when it is shedding firm load, okay? So um, the normal rules of supply and demand are not in effect. You're letting, you need to let the demand set the price because you're <coughs> shedding firm load. When ERCOT stops taking that out of market action, when firm load, there's no longer any firm load shed, then that commission order in our minds ended and the normal rules started to apply. So I understand that, um, that ERCOT um, and others may have decided um, that you know, they had a preference to keep that going on, but that's a substitution of judgment for the, uh, what I would call the letter of the commission order. So the, 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 the shedding of firm load stopped at X point. Yes. 
but the prevention of coming online with utilities also continued. You can't make those two be the same thing. Is that what you're saying? That, that's not the same thing as shedding load because it's already been shed. They're just not let, allowing them to come back on. So the, the firm load shed refers to ERCOT doing controlled outages mm -hmm. for residential customers. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let me stop you there for a second. Then. Yes, I keep hearing the assumption is residential customers, that that's been the standard that's been assumed. Yes. Is that in the rule somewhere? Is that stated? I'm just trying to get to what is actually stated. Industrial customers don't typically get shed in reliability conditions. They can choose to go offline if they're price responsive. So they might see a $9,000 mm -hmm. price and say, I don't want to pay that and come offline on their own. I understand there might have been some, you know, um, um, requests made of them by other entities to go offline, but that was not an action by the ERCOT ISO operator, which is what runs the wholesale market. So these assumptions that are being made about residential versus uh, industrial are assumptions, are they, are they assumptions that are clearly spelled out somewhere? So I guess I'm asking. Um, well, in the firm load shed plans, the firm load shed plans talk about what circuits to shed and those are residential circuits. And so it does specifically at that point talk about residential versus what can be done with utilities. I haven't seen them in a while. Okay. I can say it, okay. it determines the circuits. Okay, and then this, this concept that I think Representative King is talking about in terms of using the RUC uh, system instead. It, whether that's what's used or not, can you just kind of take me through what you think could have possibly been the outcome had, uh, had the price reverted to market at, at that 32 hour, uh, back up 32 hours at that point Okay. Uh, as opposed to continuing with the 9,000, what would have been the impact? Yes, so there were some hours where there was a lot of reserves, and that could have been a signal that, um, you know, what, what generators use to decide what to be online is both pr prices, but also forecast of prices, forecast of what the load going to be, what the wind generation is going to be doing, what the solar is going to be like. So they have sophisticated models for determining when or when not to be online. So they would have seen that, for instance, on Friday morning when there was going to be a shortfall or uh, tight conditions, then they would have seen that and said, well, if there's tight conditions, there should be high prices and I'll be online for that. So the idea is to let the fundamentals of the grid drive the prices, not the other way around, not let the price drive the fundamentals of it. And I get that. I get what you're saying there. Um, I understand from some previous testimony, if I'm remembering correctly, though, that there was still concern that some of these generation plants were not able to, were still going off. They weren't able to maintain and, and provide power to the grid. Is that not correct? That's what I heard as well, that there was that concern. So would that not be factored into a decision that would need to be made here? Because the market can do only do so much if there's no, and I think this is what Representative King was saying to a certain extent too, if it only works if there's power there to be incentivized. And if it's not there, then how does this work? Okay. Um, so I think a different judgment could have been let the market work and if generators ask to first of all you're still in an emergency alert so if you're still in an emergency alert you um you can't really go offline um and if you're asked to stay online it becomes a ruck that we talked about right and um in fact a lot of the day there was plenty of reserves and and the price being artificially set at nine thousand dollars was causing more actually causing more generators to be online than needed to be okay so there was an abundant supply that wasn't an issue for many hours there were now there were tight conditions on friday morning that were forecast but that you don't need the price to be nine thousand for an entire day to be able to hit that high hour okay on friday morning Okay. And then the final question I have has to do with something you said, and I'm sorry if I didn't get this right. I was trying to jot things down when you were talking about the cost of fuel. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, going from like 2 or $3 to 
hundreds of dollars. Um, so we're talking about gas. Natural gas. Yeah, so, so from your vantage point, what was, what was the role that natural gas played in this whole scenario? Yes, so the high gas prices necessitated there to be high energy prices in order for people to be able to burn that natural gas and not lose money. Um, but that's okay. So that's one of the reasons why the commission ordered to um, put this order in place to make sure that while you're shedding firm load, that that price is reflected in there appropriately. Um, and that helped the certainty that people could go out and pay whatever they needed to pretty much to get the gas during those firm load shed intervals. And there's, um, there's no, there's no uh, regulatory control over the gas prices. That's my understanding. So it can just go up and up and up and impact this carefully crafted market plan that we have here for electricity. There's a cap on energy price. Uh, uh, yes. Well, there's effectively a cap on energy prices at $9,000. And you can think of that because natural gas is typically the marginal uh, fuel type for generators and ERCOT, then that's kind of a natural, that can provide sort of a natural cap on natural gas prices. Um, but as far as I know, there's no actual cap. Okay, I do have one more question. In terms of, of your uh, assessment here uh, from an economic perspective, which is what you've been asked to do and you're the independent third party, non, you have no interest in this, you're just looking at the economics here. Yes. Would there not be a role for uh, a technical audit, if you will, by not the economic end of the spectrum, but the engineering or whatever the correct word would be of the spectrum to look at the judgment calls made by ERCOT operators in regard to the situation at hand, separate and apart from the economics? Yeah, I don't know about the audit. I'll just say that I think we all have, you know, I have a list of lessons learned just from what I observed, and I imagine ERCOT has the same thing, and, um, you know, the commission as well, and so we're all going to be working together to go through those lessons learned. And I think there's a number of things that this event has taught us that we can make decisions about how to change procedures in the future, how to change the protocols, the rules, whatever needs to change to um, to accommodate any of those lessons learned. Yeah, the point being though that it's not just economics, it's also scientific uh, data and uh, decisions that, that would, would need to be, the judgment there would need to be judged by those that are in that field that have a scientific background and expertise in that area. These are, economics and science are two different things, though they're obviously having to work together here. Yeah, that's right. And I, I would imagine that so that the reliability entity, I'm sure that they have plans to do, to conduct their own investigations and, and audits and whatever else would come from this because they cover the reliability side. I think that's what you're talking about yeah. is yeah. the operators and engineering judgment that occurred. Thank you. Chair, recognize Mr. Hunter. The bottom line, the public pays, don't they? Uh, load pays for... Let, let's not you to load and all that. I've heard enough of lawyer and utility lingo. Who pays? Um, it's the rate payer, correct? Customers eventually have to pay. So it all comes back to the people, correct? It's hard to say. I know you want the simple answer, but there's It's pretty there. simple. Yeah, well, investors can absorb profits and losses. There are people. There are people. At and the where do the costs get passed? Uh, if they don't get absorbed by the investors, they get passed to the rate payers. So the ultimate is my question, is the public. I've answered your question. No, you haven't. Yes. There you go. It's a yes. Now, in your letter dated March 11th, I want, because we got a lot of people listening, and a lot of the public is listening, and I think we get off in all this terminology. Let's get right to the point so the consumer, the person who pays, understands. So in your letter, 
you say the decision resulted overpriced energy in ERCOT's real-time market by $16 billion. Correcting this error will not reduce costs to consumers by $16 billion. Correct? Yes. So for the world to hear, Sixteen billion is not going to be reduced. It's got to be paid. That's the market value of the error. But it's the got payments to be are, paid. The payments doesn't. are different. The pay. It's got to be paid, right? Somebody is on the side of those transactions. Somebody's got to pay, right? It could be banks. I, I, I have to disagree with you. It may not be the load. Somebody could be a bank. Could Somebody could. Uh, it could be a bank. So somebody's got to pay, correct? Yes. So are all our folks going to be getting high bills? I, I am an expert in the wholesale market, not the retail market. Well, I'm, I'm getting a lot of disclaimers up here at the microphone. <laughs> I haven't I seen this much since a stock offering. I want to pro provide pr appropriate expertise to you. Look, I'm here because we had a tragic event. Yes. People suffered, and we're here today, not really to dance around the question, it's to tell the public there's been an awful price cost. And I believe the bottom line is the public is impacted and may have to pay. And you have indicated somebody must pay, correct? Yes. All right. And what you said in the letter is correcting the error probably isn't going to reduce that $16 billion, correct? Yes. And then you just answered me, somebody, whatever the definition is, has got to pay. Yes. All right. Now, one of my problems with this whole utility situation has been communication. Seems like everybody doesn't want to explain exactly what happens and has theories. And I've been extremely disappointed, and I think the members of this committee know about the awful communication that some of the legislators in the Capitol have received. And still, I will let you know, still, in the members of this committee, I haven't heard from people. I've heard from a lot of non ERCOT people. But I want you to know, some of us are still waiting for answers. So the final question I have, now that we've figured out the bottom line of who's paying, to this committee, what is your conclusion? What do you want us to understand you're telling us? That we have three recommendations. And recommendation one is what? Recommendation one is about capping the ancillary services prices. Okay, so the general public knows capping ancillary is what? So those are reserves that are paid to help reliability for load and those costs get uplifted to load. So that's a, that's a direct impact that I feel comfortable saying reduces costs to, to consumers to load. And you're saying that will reduce costs to the public? By 900 million. What's number two? Number two has already been a, did I say three? You said three. I did say three, yeah. So just wanted to make sure I covered the second one was on our first. I'm sorry, do you have a button for your microphone? Is there a button? I don't see a button. Should I stand closer? I'll just stand closer. <laughs> Try to talk into it a little louder. Okay. We're getting some reports that they're having difficulty. Oh, okay. Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll speak closer. Um, the second recommendation was already taken up by the Public Utility Commission, and it's around ancillary services that were paid for but not provided. So we can set that aside and say that's already been handled. So well, that's our recommendation number two. Okay, so recommendation number two for everybody that's listening. Your analysis has been, it has been complied with fully. Yes, correct. What's your third? The third recommendation is to 
reprice the energy to correct the energy prices for the 18th and the 19th when firm load shed was over but the prices were administratively set at nine thousand dollars and that you're recommending yes all right and does that help the public i believe so yes all right you're part of potomac economics yes and this is an independent economic research firm we primarily provide market monitoring services which is what we provide in ERCOT, and we provide those services to a number of markets and who is your client who hired you the public utility commission so the puc pays you to analyze ERCOT and the market it's a little more complicated than that the puc selects us and um, approves my uh, selection as the director of ERCOT IMM. However, we're in a three-party contract with ERCOT because the funds for our services actually come from ERCOT. So PUC hires you in Potomac and it's paid for by ERCOT? Correct. So the rate payer pays you? Yes. And you're going to tell us that these recommendations are the best for the ratepayer. I don't represent any side of this as an independent market monitor. Uh, we rake recommendations based on what the correct economic outcome is. But my question, your three recommendations you believe are best for the public. I think it's the right thing to do. So that's your best options? Yes. Thank you. Chair, I can ask Mr. Lucio. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you can see me through yes. these few pieces of glass. Um, I, I'm trying to understand and appreciate the circumstances that my co-op is in back home. Okay. So Magic Valley Electric Co-op has a big portion of what um, the real grant, the, the Kind of footprint of the real grand valley and they're telling me and they're like austin energy and a few munis that they supply power to the grid as generators but they also take power off the grid as consumers and retailers mm -hmm. there are a few that kind of sit in a few different seats they're not independent and isolated like some of the other stakeholders uh in ERCOT or in our state and what they're telling me is we may have made money on the generation side mm -hmm. as we supplied to the grid but we paid very high costs when we took from the grid to provide to our consumers yes and if you reprice on the generation side that doesn't impact us or just on our side of the ledger where we took from the grid so what they're saying is yes we made money on this side of the ledger as generators but we paid exceptionally more for the power we took off the grid so it's a net neutral and if you adjust over here on what we made on the generation side we still have very high bills for the power we consumed because they they don't run some power to the grid and then power on the back end to their consumers they have to all put it on the grid and then all take it off the grid right so i'm trying to understand if we reprice on the generation side and they have to adjust how much they're going to get paid from ERCOT because we repriced. They're telling me it won't reprice on this side for how much we were paying for what we took from the grid. Is that accurate? Well, I'm surprised to hear that. Um, and, that's, and, and I'm sorry that the answers can't always be super clear because it is very entity specific. So we talked a little bit about hedging. So it just depends on if if you're fully in the spot market, if you're fully in the ERCOT real-time market, then those two, if we change the price, they'll net out on both sides. They should net out on both yeah, sides. Yeah, so the, the, the cost that net buyers are paying and net sellers are being paid will be the same. Okay, I wanna make sure of that. Yes, now they might have some other transactions that are in the mix. Um, maybe. And, and what we've seen, so we did look at public power and overall public power is helped by the price correction but there is I think one or two that might be harmed by doing so so it really just depends if they were net sellers or net buyers in the real-time market you know if they had more generation than their load 
then they made money and we by correcting the price might take some of that back and, and I don't since they're a co-op and they're owned by the people that they serve I mean it's not like they're for for profit necessarily right and I so I'm just wanting to make sure that if we adjust over here they're not having to they're not losing money I don't mind if they don't make money right. <laughs> does that make sense I just don't want them to have to come out of pocket so for those that are similarly situated and let's just it, so we have fixed price products for consumers right um, that's one of the of, uh, that's a uh, that's one of the products. line share of rate payers here yes, in that's what in, I, I in Texas price are on fixed price so if the cost is significantly more because of the weather event how does that get passed on to the consumer in a fixed price situation right. so in the immediate term it won it's a fixed price so I, and I, I'm going to talk about competitive retailers here because I think it's a little different for public power but competitive retailers they offer you a fixed price during a contract term and that price cannot change during that contract term so mine is up in May and so until then they can't charge me any more than 8.4 cents that I'm currently being charged but I just as a homeowner I fully expect that when I'm in the market in May to get a new contract I'm guessing it'll be higher now I, I sure that some investor um, some invested investor owned companies are going to absorb some of the losses the numbers here are so high I expect to get a higher rate the next time this is me as a homeowner again I'm not a re retail market expert now public power is different they are cooperatives or municipals that are more what we call a traditionally regulated utility where you know they're nonprofit and they're they have costs and they just pass those costs on I would say those are probably more those customers are more likely to see costs passed on because there's nothing to absorb it there's no investor in the middle to absorb like the city of Brownsville and Magic Valley Electric Co-op th those folks that serve a very underserved part of Texas right are going to have a unique scenario to, de to tent to that's right now with. some public power you know whether it was due to the rotating outages they had less load than they might you know maybe they had more generation than they had load so there was some public power that was what I would call a net seller to the market and so they might have made some money and, and that will be taken and back to, and to generate this power they had to pay significantly higher natural gas prices if that's what fed their generation plan yes and can we as Texas regulate or uh, fix the price during that period for natural gas I don't know I was told by my staff that we can because that's federal federally regulated so if we fix the price on what power generators can sell I understand that I don't want people you know I want to try to contain loss as much as I can yes but if so what I'm what I'm hearing is if generators we're told you're going to get paid this price yes they made a business decision on whether or not they wanted to sell to the grid yes based on the amount of natural gas prices that went way up yes. and they sold to the grid if we adjust prices below their cost to produce then they in, in then then they're going to have to figure out how to recoup that and part of my concern is that it's going to get passed on to consumers which yes. is always the asking. business model yes I, I understand what you're asking so um, I'll explain a little bit more about how the pricing is determined and how this pricing intervention was um, undertaken is that there's what I'll call a dispatch price and generators put in offers so let's say you know natural gas is two dollars and they have what we call a 10 heat rate so they they have to burn you know 10 times the natural gas price in order to produce a megawatt of energy and so they might offer twenty dollars okay that's what we call their marginal cost of energy or 25 or some somewhere around there okay so my expectation is that um, generators should have continued that practice so if their marginal cost was a thousand dollars and they should have offered a thousand dollars okay and that'll all be reflected in the dispatch price now there's some adders to that there's these adders that compensate for out-of-market actions and those go on top so it doesn't affect the dispatch price it goes on top of that and um, so therefore they should not be out revenue from an energy basis now we did talk in our most recent letter 
um, because I've heard folks that have requested that a rock-like settlement for those days, which means that they can cover all components of their cost. And we're not recommending that, but we're not opposing it. So if that's a concern um, of folks, then I think, you know, I think it's going to be a small part of it. And so to the extent that folks feel like they're not going to recover their costs just based on the dispatch price, which is what we're talking about, will remain pretty much after you do the price correction, um, then we wouldn't oppose a rock-like settlement for those. Yeah, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm just concerned that, you know, the theme of this sounds great, right? We're going to do this price adjustment, and it's, it's for the Texas consumer, and I get it, but I'm afraid that there, in Donna's district, in my district, there will be a lot of people that are going to bear the biggest burden of it because they just happen to be in a scenario where you, you might be able to affect this side of the ledger, but you can't affect the natural price natural gas prices that you paid um, so you might not be able to make enough money uh, or just the, the revenue over here but you cannot pay your gas bills as a company and then that will be passed on to the consumer yeah and I in my district it'll happen because all of it is either muni or co-op pretty much in my district so I'm 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 for saving <laughs> ratepayers no doubt about it but if I think that not only they're going to be winners and losers on the business side of it, but they're going to be winners and losers on the consumer side of it as well. And I think it's a very complex situation we need to look at. Thank you. Yeah, it is. And there's three, uh, if you don't mind me mentioning, um, you know, we talked about the components of price and that adder gets paid for um, operating reserves. It's essentially for generators to sit and not move up. And um, that is a direct uplift to load serving entities. So. That, that's a billion dollars that I can say will absolutely go back to load serving entities, to munis and co-ops and re competitive retailers. Chair McMaster, Mr. Ring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, um, I think in part we're here because the governor issued a, a proclamation, or a, I guess it's a proclamation, adding an, an, an additional emergency item to the um, to this session, and that is the issue of, I don't know how he worded it, but it had to do with the the, um, the fact that you identified there had been overcharging or overbilling or, I don't know, would you say, uh, error, right? Mm -hmm. Overpricing. Uh, pricing error, right? And yesterday the Senate uh, moved on that because the governor said, kind of, I, I don't know, Mr. D'Andrea will say this again, I guess, but he said, Mr. D'Andrea said last week, he couldn't fix this. Uh, his position was that only the legislature could take action to fix it. Something along those lines. And I think that was reflected in Governor uh, Abbott's letter to Lieutenant Governor Patrick on Friday. The governor said only the legislature can do this. So we're here, right? And, um, and the Senate passed a bill yesterday. And I know we joke sometimes about the Senate and the House and all that. The fact is about half the senators used to be House members. I, I know the Senate respects us, and I certainly respect the Senate. You want a bill to become law, you pass it in the House, it has to pass in the Senate and vice versa. And, and so where I'm at, where I was not long after you all made your pronouncement, is that uh, the people of Texas are about to get hit. And it may be a long-term hit over many months, years, I don't know. But they're going to get hit with another tax. That's what this is to me. This is just the way my mind works. You have to understand I've spent most of the last four years, well, leading up to last session, on property tax reform, right? Try to sum up property taxes. And now we're going to hit them with another tax. I'll call it the electricity tax, because that's what it is, right? And it's the same people, by the way, because the people that will pay this either own a house or so they pay property taxes or they live in an apartment and they pay property taxes through their rent. So this is a, a really important issue. And in my mind, I look back at my experience. I have dealt with issues where we have determined that doctors overcharged. And those doctors had to pay back, give back that money, right? through the years. Uh, we have examples where the controller 
charge many businesses across the state of Texas, and they do every year, more taxes than they owe. And so if, the, if that business owner is you know, capable enough or moves on it, sometimes they can get that money back. Many times, it's, and it's billions of dollars, right? They get that back because they were overcharged, right? Um, if we enter into a contract, if the state contracts somebody from the private sector to do something for the state, and uh, if that private contractor comes in and says, this is gonna be another half a billion dollars, but we look and see that they are overcharging, we don't pay it. We say, well, uh -uh. that was your mistake. We don't owe you that, we're not gonna pay it. So in this case, a governmental entity allowed this pricing error. And by the way, when you talk about 16 billion, you're talking about the 32 hours, right? Those, we, those famous 32 hours. Yes. Let's talk for, for just a second. Can we talk about the whole period of time? How many hours are we talking about that whole period of time? 40 something? I'm sorry, I don't have that. Okay, do you have any idea how much, if, the whole t if that whole period of time was over, uh, an overpricing error, how much that would be? So I don't believe it's a pricing error. Huh? I, I don't believe that that period was a pricing That's error. That's not what I'm so asking you. Calculate you. that number. That's not what I'm asking you. You figured out that 16, that the 32 hours equals 16 billion, right? Yes. Can you extrapolate for us and tell us to go backwards? The what? whole event was 46.6 .6 billion. Okay, so because of PUC slash ERCOT um, rate payers, taxpayers, were charged an extra $46 billion in that, during that freeze. Is that right? I, I wouldn't call it extra. That's the market value of the energy that was- Had it not been for the freeze, would they have been charged that $46 billion? No, I expect the price would have been lower. Much lower. Yes, okay. So as it is, you know, I'd say to my colleagues, our folks out there taking a hit that, hey, it's the, the PUC and ERCOT said it's okay during this time you can charge this much, $9,000 a megawatt hour during this period of time, $46 billion. $46 billion they got to make during that period of time. You're disputing that $16 billion of that should not, they should, they should have not had permission to charge that extra 16. So you're telling me that, you're telling us that it was okay to charge them $30 billion. The extra 16 was, a pricing error. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then, because it gets cloudy for me, I don't know about other members up here, but you start off by saying, well, it was $16 billion pricing error for the 32 hours, but after, settle, but, but settlement amounts differ, and so it's 4.2, but explain that a little bit more. Sure, so the $16 billion number is the market value of that energy that was produced. So mm -hmm. you have a volume. Under the pricing error. You have a price and the, you have a volume. The, the $16 billion was the market was during those hours. under the pricing yes. error. Um, you have a volume of energy that was produced and you multiply it by the price it was produced at. So um, that's, a to that's the total market value of that energy. Under the pricing error scenario. Yes. Okay. But you, there's a number of folks that hedge, they buy forward they purchase energy ahead of time and also there are corporate entities that have generation and load in them so we were just talking about the cooperatives they have generation to, and they also have load there's a number of entities like that and so that money is not going to go anywhere because it's one corporate entity so if we take at the corporate energy entity level and we consider the hedges at or cut that we're aware of so i'm not talking about uh, you know, and I, I still do want to address some of that outside error part, outside ERCOT part. But within ERCOT, the settlement impact of correcting that energy price is $4.2 billion. And $1 billion of that is up, what we call uplift. So what does a $16 billion figure mean? Nothing? Yeah, so it's the market value. So um, <laughs> I have like a soybean example. I don't know if that helps. But, you know, if you think about, um, you know, a farmer has a bunch of crops, at, takes it to the market, and the market price at that time is X. So they've got a volume of soybeans and an X market price. That's what I'm talking about. But before the growing season, they might have locked in a different rate. They might have had a side deal to lock in a different rate. So that's the settlement impact 
of selling those soybeans, but the market value is there. That's what the real-time market value of soybeans is, times the volume. So your position is that the correction, the bill that the, pen, that the Senate passed yesterday, is it your position that the correction that they are making would be $4.2 billion? Yes, that, that's the settlement impact. Okay. And, um, and, if, and if we do the same thing on the House side, that's what we would be affecting. That's your, that's your, that's yes. your testimony. So in part, it seems to me when candidly, you know, in case if you've watched this, in case you haven't figured out, I, I, uh, I'm sort of with the Senate and, and I guess the governor, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't want to put words in the governor's mouth. Maybe Mr. Dandrea will when he testifies where the governor supports the Senate bill. But I don't, I don't believe that taxpayers should be taxed an electricity tax for a mistake that a bureaucratic agency made. It's that simple for me. And that those that think that they're going to get that, now you're saying 4.2 billion. I, I, I still, I'm still not sure that I believe that. And it's not you. I don't know you. I'm sure you're honest and honorable and all that stuff. But when you first came up with the 16 billion, and we say, as we say in Spanish, saca mediae, Get me out. Take that. Don't don't think of a white horse, Mr. M. Close your eyes, but don't think of a white horse. Don't think of 16 billion. It's really only 4.2. So we're going to stick taxpayers with 4.2 because of a bureaucratic mistake. And what I say to the private sector, and I work with businesses all the time, that money was never yours. So when you want to come up here and argue, hey, if we reverse this, I mean. The economy is going to collapse. Wall Street is going to collapse. Cat, I think I heard the word cattle futures. I mean, I don't even, it's all over the place, right? I don't believe that because that money was never yours. It was a bureaucratic mistake. I mean, that's what it is. It's a bureaucracy. PUC slash ERCOT is a bureaucracy by definition. So that money was never theirs. So when, if we fix this, to me, it comes down to a, a very simple proposition. Do we allow um, an illegal $4.2 billion tax be passed on to taxpayers in the state of Texas or not? And those that want to say, hey, you know, we're entitled to that money because, hey, that's what the ERCOT and PC said we could charge. My response is, hey guys, you got $30 billion. Is that not enough? You got $30 billion. The 32 hours? To me, it's like a compromise. If we're, we're sitting here, really, guys, what we're doing, we're sitting up here talking about a compromise. We let them keep the 30 billion, but we claw back, to use Phil King, Chairman King's word, we claw back 4.2. And, and, and what it is is we're preventing the people of Texas from taking another hit on taxes, 4.2 billion. As it is, they're taking a hit anyway. And so to me, this, were we, Chairman and, and members, were we to move forward on reversing the error, which you now say is $4.2 billion, um, I think it is not nearly enough. In my view, it's not nearly enough. But this is a building of compromise. We have to compromise to move forward, right? We can't do everything that Richard Raymond wants, can't do everything that Eddie Lucio wants, Chris Patty wants. We have to sort of compromise. And, and to me, what your testimony is telling me is um, that 4.2 billion was never theirs in the first place, and, and we shouldn't, and they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't be upset about it. And, and Representative Lucio, yeah, no, I think that we can take the appropriate action so that if you, you know, if you had to pay more, and if, if you were getting paid more because you were giving at a certain price, but you had to pay over here then yeah, we should be able to pass legislation that balances it out so that your co-op is fine and at least, you know, you know, the, the people of Texas are minus one more tax that is illegal. And I don't know how else to say it. And by the way, if we pass this legislation, I know Mr. D'Andrea was kind of tripping over first calling it. He said that if he changed this, it would be a criminal act or something like that. And when I asked him, well, would you go to jail? Would you be arrested? He said, no, 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 no. So I think he knows the difference. He's a lawyer between criminal and civil. And if we take this action and somebody out there wants to sue, they can sue.
if they think they got a good case, good luck with the jury on that one. But um, I, I, I appreciate you bringing this to our attention. I'm not sure if you had that we would have ever found out. And I think it's incumbent on us members to try to do what we can to mitigate the hit that the people of Texas took and are going to keep taking if we don't pass some legislation. Chair, sure, recognize Mr. Smithy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions that you may have addressed, and you may or you may not be the right person to ask. But let, let me ask you anyway. Uh, did any, um, as far as you know, did any generators act in reliance on the pricing decisions that were made for what was it, the 17th and 18th? 18th, 18th and 19th. 18th and 19th. Okay. Did, did the generators act in reliance on those? pricing decisions. I suspect they did, yes. So, um, is there any precedent for this? In, first of all, in Texas, are you aware of, of PUC ever going back and repricing after an event? The PUC, no. Uh, are you aware of that happening in any other jurisdiction? Did you work in other, I think you said your company works in other jurisdictions. I don't know if you've had any experience with other jurisdictions or not. Yes, other jurisdictions have done repricings after that. So there is precedent in other jurisdictions, but as far as you know, not in Texas. That's right. But again, I don't know if they were ordered by the commission. So, I mean, even ERCOT has done price corrections before, but not to my knowledge, ordered by the commission. So one of the concerns I've got is if, if the legislature comes in now, like the Senate bill did yesterday, and basically orders the, you know, the Senate basically says, to the one PUC commissioner, you do this now, you reprice. And uh, it gives the PUC dis uh, commissioner no discretion, it just says do it. And uh, if, the leg if this legislature does this as a precedent, does that cause any concerns in the marketplace in the future? That the deal we think we have and that we're operating under could be retroactively undone by the legislature? I think you make a good point. I think it's something to weigh the balance. So I don't want to um, act as though it's an easy decision. I mean, at the time it was, so on the day, on the 18th, it was an easy decision to say, you know, we don't believe that this is how these days should be priced. Even when we sent the letter on the, or, you know, we communicated with the PUC even before that when we sent the letter, you know, it still seems a fairly clear choice. Now, standing here, late March, it becomes more complex because of the uh, derivatives markets that are settled based on these markets. Um, we recognize that there are large costs on both sides of making this change. We still fall on the side of it being the right thing to do, but want to acknowledge that there are good arguments and reasonable people can disagree. Okay, well, uh, tell me, and this is my last question, but if you could, just the mechanics of how repricing works. Let's say a bill similar to the Senate bill passes both houses, signed by the governor, and so the, the legislature orders the, commis the commissioner to reprice a according to the bill, and it's done. Then, then what, what does that set in motion? How, does it, how, how, does, how do you reprice the market uh, retroactively. So I expect it would uh, initiate the price correction process at ERCOT, which is such that they they um, they publish the new prices in a file, and then the settlements will begin based on those new prices. So they'll take all of the accounting that was done on the original prices and they'll redo it based on the new prices, and then they'll settle up the difference. Well, what repercussions does that have? You know, the, the, our commissioner told us. Last week, last week, that this would have repercussions in other markets, um, perhaps worldwide. D do you see that as a, as an issue? So, unfortunately, the ice market, the Intercontinental Exchange, has already settled those days. So, it would have been great if they had held the settlement of those, but that did not occur. So, those have already settled. So that's why I was saying that there are costs on both sides, and that does complicate things because normally the der you know the underlying market that the derivative is priced on, those two things are in alignment, and this will bring this will misalign those prices. So, can you can you re 
do those markets that have, those that have already been settled? I would ask ICE that. Okay. I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Short. Right. Chair recognizes Mr. Kim. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and I guess that's where I'm struggling a little bit too. I agree that it was a mistake, and those last 32 hours should be should have been repriced, and that it was really easy to do that on Saturday, and and a little more difficult a week later. And now it's really hard to think about mechanically how that works. Is there another option available to put money back into the system to compensate for those $4.2 billion other than repricing in the manner that, that you've suggested? In other words, I've heard options thrown out of maybe securitizing debt or something like that to socialize and spread out that loss over a number of years. Is there some other mechanism? I'm, I'm concerned like, I mean, I agree it was a mistake and it should be undone. I'm just kind of trying to figure out how you do it six weeks later, five weeks later, and, and, and so is there another alternative to deal with that 4.2 billion other than just going back and pretending that it's it's 11:55 on Wednesday night? I'm sure policymakers can make that call. I, I you know, we I really wanted to point out that there is a portion of, and so not the 4.2 billion, but there's a portion of this. Um, and I know this is highly technical, but there's a portion of this that just represents a direct uplift to load for people who were online but not producing energy. And that removing that would save a billion dollars. Right. So I don't think it's an all that's or That's the nine hundred million dollar figure. No, that's the billion. The nine hundred million is the ancillary services all right. capping those down at nine thousand. For the entire period. For the entire period. Yeah. Anytime it was over nine thousand, bring it. And so down. where does the one billion come from? The one billion is it's part of the energy price correction, but um, so it, it, it's Before a little more complicated statutorily if you think about how that would work. But you can you, you can just say we're not paying for reserves on the we're not paying for those operating reserves on those days when the price was artificially inflated. So remove that section. Um, if I'm trying to be creative about other solutions, so is that a billion on top of 4.2? No, or is that that, is, that is a component of the 4.2. Okay, that's one one that, part of it. Okay, so you get 4.2 minus 900 million. So. Sorry, the 4.2 is, and I'm Are sorry. Are the ancillary services included in ancillary the Ancillary services separate than okay. the 4.2, so it's actually 5.1 if you include Okay, so then you yet. take out the 900 for the ancillary services here, 4.2, and then that billion is a component of the 4.2. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So has the PUC or ERCOT ever used other mechanisms other than clawing back repricing to settle up? No, so this would be a, a more what, what I was calling a more creative solution to just kind of micro-target a particular item because if you're trying to think about something that doesn't have the same downstream impacts to these outside markets, this uplift is kind of separate from that. But that, and, and at the end of the day, that 4.2 is going to impact the, the people that are going to feel the relief from that are going to be. Primarily the reps and the retail component of the munis and the co-ops. It'll be primarily net buyers. Net buyers could be all. There's all types of entities on that side, but it is primarily reps, munis, and co-ops. Yes. All right. But there's. Multiple. So it's primarily going to be felt on the retail side. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry for going twice. Yes, sir. Chair Thank recognizes Mr. Metcalf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at the beginning of your testimony, you said the the system was designed to let the market work. Is that correct? Yes. But then one of your three recommendations was to reprice the energy markets. Yes. So how do you let the markets work if you want to reprice the markets? So I want to have the intervention, the administrate so that on those two days, the market wasn't working. It was administratively set. I want to remove the administrative price setting on those two days. Thank you. Chair recognizing Ms. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just reminded of one other option that I wanted to ask you about uh, in terms of if there's other ways that we could recoup costs here. Uh, 
we apparently in the 70s did a windfall tax. How would that, how could that be applied here? I'm not familiar with a windfall tax. So we're just, that would work. we would be taxing on this uh, windfall profit that was made by certain entities during this event and actually creating legislation to, uh, this, the legislature did this before in the 70s. What, what's a federal tax? I would have to find out more, Mr. Okay. Smithy. But yeah, uh, certainly I'm just asking about it just because I'd like to know since we were looking at what other options we might have. Uh, if you're asking if we can calculate the financial position of entities, we can do that at least from an, within the ERCOT standpoint. We can tell you which ones are on the winning side and the losing side, if that's the question. I don't know anything about a winner. Okay, I just, we were just talking about auction. One more thing I just wanted to clarify because you got a lot of questions from people up here about how this 4.2 billion that we're talking about now. Yes. Because that's the difference in the market and what actually was the, in your opinion, an incorrectly imposed higher amount. That's the accounting was, value of the- Thank you, whatever the right words are. Yeah. 4.2 billion. Mm -hmm. So that 4.2 billion, I think you're trying to say is if there were a correction and that was repriced, that those costs would be absorbed in a variety of ways and not necessarily directly imposed on rate on the customers. I would agree with that statement. That, that's the money that's going to change hands. Right. What it happens with it after it changes hands, you know, we don't have visibility into that. Do you have any idea where Texas falls in terms of our costs for uh, power compared to other states? Yes, typically we have among the lowest, um, at least, you know, we typically are looking at other what we call ISOs, independent system mm -hmm. operators that operate these organized markets and it's among the lowest. So this, it's not to suggest that we would want to increase taxes and I think uh, my colleague over here refers to this as a tax, whatever we want to call it. Uh, people want to make sure that we keep our costs low and keep with it. The rate payers are paying, the taxpayers, the customers are paying low, but at some point you have to pay for a service that you want to have provided. And in this case, we're talking about being able to have a resiliency and reliability, and there's a certain cost attached to that, is there not? There certainly will be a cost attached to that, and it can be managed in a variety of ways. Right, okay, thank you. Anyone else's slides on? I think I've gotten a, a, a bet some more pop up after I ask a few here, but <clears throat> Ms. Bivens, thank you for being here today. and. Um, uh, I have several questions for you, and, and I also was kind of making note of uh, some some quotes, uh, basically some of your responses here that I'd like to get some clarification on as well, and uh, uh, some were a little interesting, but I, I heard you say a moment ago, and let me start with this, on the, on the day, it was an easy decision. Do you recall saying that? For me, it was. For, for, you, for you, it was. You're not speaking to the decision that was made. I'm speaking to my opinion about that decision when I communicated with on the, that on that day with the chairman, the then chairman mm -hmm. of the PC and the ERCOT CEO. I bought, I okay. My opinion was strong at that moment. How many different opinions? Are, well, I'll say we'll call them letters. You know, how many of those have you had? Three letters. Three letters, and and why is that? Why, why, why were there three letters? Yes, the, the first one was on March 1st, and it was specifically targeting the ancillary services. So we kind of separated out the energy piece and the ancillary services piece. Talks were ongoing about the energy side, and we filed that letter three days later on the 4th. This one that we filed on the 11th was around, now we've got settlement data, we've got all the meters have been read, we can go in and try to estimate the financial position of certain corporate entities and can give you that more accounting number that you might desire to see. Okay. So by your admission there, is it fair to say that you have more information as you stand here today than you had on February 18th? On February. From a data standpoint. I mean, as far as your analysis and what you're giving us today and what you would put in your most recent letter. I have more data, yes. Yeah. I, my opinion on the 18th was based on economic principles. Uh, so is it fair to say then, you know, in some ways, your opinion can change over time? Obviously, when you get 
new data, you crush the numbers, you see the results, you see what, what was the outcome that you may or may not have anticipated, maybe you did, Yes. Uh, but you have more information today, right? So you're, you're standing before us today with an opinion based on, I don't know, it's perfect data, but I mean, I'll just call it that. You're standing here today with full knowledge of what the out, I mean, what, what the result is, right? I understand the downstream impacts and that we, we still come down on the side of right. Uh, things that you may or not ultimately known uh, on the 18th, for example. Yes, and time has passed, and things the 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 ground has kind of shifted under us a little bit. Right. right. Uh, so um, so I want to go back to that that time. Um, so you, you obviously you agree you have more information today. We all have more information today than than the people that made these decisions on uh, February 18th did. I mean, I don't think that's disputed here. So, uh, and opinions change over time based on new facts, new information. We do it all the time in the legislature, Agreed. right? Um, and so, I want to go to your letter for a second on that. When, when getting to this discussion on whether or not this is an error or uh, a management decision based on the best information at the time, and, and maybe some specific concerns I want to point out, where you actually uh, said, and I'll just read, with regards to correcting the real-time energy prices, we note that the actions of ERCOT could understandably be perceived as a reliability instruction mm -hmm. to generators to keep their resources committed throughout the event. At the correctest, corrected price level, some generators may not cover all of their fixed as offered operating costs. You remember that in your letter? Yes. Sure, honestly. So, um, what about that? You know, if they're there and they're making an ultimate decision at that time because they have concerns, uh, as you even point out, about reliability and whether or not they can keep their resources committed throughout the event, uh, do you think that might have factored into their decision to keep those prices at that level? Uh, I. And I'm going to, they're going to be up later, so I'm going to ask this question, uh, but I, I'm, I'm curious about your opinion on that. I absolutely understand that they had a reliability goal that they were trying to accomplish with this pricing intervention. Um, I disagree that it was in compliance with the commission order that was issued on the 15th. And um, I, it's at odds with an efficient market, you know, supplementing judgment for uh, the normal supply and demand and um, making that order last longer than it was written to last. I, I understand we could talk about models and the economy and what this and that that theoretically would happen. Or what, I'm talking about what happened. And so at that time, um, your opinion at that time, was that based on you having complete knowledge of, obviously we would talk about residential load shed had stopped. However, would you agree there, that doesn't mean everyone's back on, right? There are people still off for very, I mean, it could be Storm various damage. other reasons. Yeah, they're, they're, they're off. And at that time, when you're making that, that uh, you have that opinion, do you know exactly what that is? I mean, the, that number? the number of megawatts that were still off? Yeah, the, the number of people that were, yeah, still without power. I do not. All right. Do you have any idea when we talk about the industrial load shed side of the piece, uh, how much that was? If all of a sudden we said, all clear, guys. Everybody come back up. Flip the light switch. Do you have any idea how much that was? That takes um, a lot of data analysis to get there. We've got some preliminary numbers that maybe it was around 3,000 megawatts. Right. But do, do you think you had sufficient information on that day to say, if that were to happen, that we wouldn't plunge right back into a situation we were in? So first of all, there were healthy reserves throughout that day. There was room for demand to come back. Nobody was telling demand not to come back. And again, this adder, this price adder, and this pricing intervention is, is intended to correct for out-of-market actions that the ERCOT operator takes. Industrial load makes choices all the time about whether to be on or off. And they do it for their own reasons or they do it for the prices that are at ERCOT. And that's not directed by the ISO and it does not directly feed the prices. But again, you, you don't know definitively, I mean, I, we can talk about reserve margin, whatever that is, and we could debate whether or not it was sufficient or not sufficient or it was too much or too little or whatever. The truth of the matter is we don't really know what the effect would have been of flipping, I'm simplifying here, of flipping that light switch back on. All industrials come back on as they're restoring power, you know, you need to do that very systematically as well so you don't cause problems. So you would admit that we don't know what, really know what the effect of that would be. We don't. ERCOT 
the ERCOT market participants handle scarcity events with regularity, that um, the price signals support the reliability, and when those principles are allowed to take uh, to take effect, then the market participants respond. We see that's we see that regularly around um, scarcity intervals, and I have no reason to think that it would be different this time. Great. Um, but there's no way for you to know or anyone there's else. There's no way. For me to you go back and talk. Definitely to say here that had they done what you suggested, that it wouldn't have resulted in us going right back where we were. I mean, you couldn't definitively say that here today. No, I right, cannot. Right. And so those folks had concerns, reliability concerns. Uh, and the last thing that anybody up here or anyone in the state would have wanted mm -hmm. was for us to go backwards. Would you agree with that? I would, but I would also say that with those healthy, healthy reserves, perhaps there could have been load on throughout the day that... Perhaps. There was no reason they couldn't be. ERCOT had, I mean, at one point, there's this physical responsive capability that's a, a determination of how much reserves are on the system, and it was... It was at um, eight, you know, around 8,000 megawatts. And just perspective-wise, we don't go into an emergency until you're, you know, in the in the 2000s. So it's very, it was very high, and there was room for demand to grow. Right. Okay. Uh, I want to kind of switch to another thing you said, and kind of brush you a little bit, and because I saw you, you were being very careful how you were answering Mr. Hunter's question earlier, and, and others as it relates to consumers. Yes. Uh, and you even talked about, uh, you know. I think you said I'm, I'm an expert in the wholesale, not not retail, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and so you didn't want to answer it um, when he kept asking you who pays. You know, if we do this, who pays? You know, and, and it's about the consumer, which we all care very much about. That's priority number one up here as we're we're debating this. And so I think it's really important for us to be make sure we're clear on this. And so I want to I want to ask for some um, some clarification on here. So you, you stated yes. You know, he says customer pays. You say yes, customer pays. So, and then you uh, also even talked about where you're on a fixed rate plan. Uh, you know, yours ends in May or whenever it is, and you fully expect that they may try to come back with higher rates, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you're in a competitive market, right? Mm -hmm. So, what are you going to do if they come back with a higher rate? I'm going to go look for another one. Right. But all retail providers were. Well, um, many retail providers were uh, financially impacted by the storm, so I think it would be difficult to go find one that's going to be cheaper than the price I have right now. All right. But, but you would agree, right, that for residential customers that are in the competitive market and have fixed price contracts, uh, they're not necessarily affected by what you're suggesting we do. Not defend. I mean, not not for certain. I mean, the folks shouldn't expect a check to come in the mail, right? That is why I was trying to be very careful about answering those questions. We're talking about the wholesale market, and I don't know what those dollars do when they leave the wholesale market. Right, right. So you you wouldn't you, you wouldn't pretend to, to tell us that as we sit up here today and we debate whether or not to do what you recommend that that consumers are going to actually see dollars. Well, I can tell you that public power entities will receive a billion. Yeah, and dollars. I want to talk about that because. Okay. So that, you know, for residential customers that are served by those MOUs or, or co-ops, at some level, those areas, I mean, obviously they're vertic vertically integrated models, so they're different. They're a different beast, okay. and I'll, I will give you that. So they may, you know, maybe part of municipally owned utility that owns generation and, you know, all that good stuff. So by nature of what they are, these, these individuals have chosen not to enter the competitive market, right, where customers could get fixed price contracts. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, so which would protect them from exposure of events like this potentially. But on the other side, and, and instead, they have a model where, in those areas where they have some profit upside, right, from generation, right, uh, as well. Uh, but with that comes the potential for some downside. So, don't you agree with that? Yes. Okay. And again, these are areas that could have elected to be in competition and have fixed price. Contracts, right? They did not opt in. Right, right, okay. So this was a decision they made to, to operate in the way that they do, right? And, 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 and per your, your statements, I mean, these are some of the folks that are most affected by this particular event. They are. Because they have more exposure. It is, and, and I also want to uh, address, we haven't really talked about today, but um, a different type of uplift called default uplift. So um, to the extent that people are not able to pay their bills, 
uh, people, I mean wholesale electric entities, aren't able to pay their bills to ERCOT. ERCOT is short money and has had to short pay entities, and they're going to have to get that money back someday. And that's going to be upload, uplifted to everybody. So whether you are a retail provider that was perfectly hedged, whether you are municipal that was perfectly hedged, then um, you will have to take a share of that uplift. All right. Those entities will. Everybody. But again, just and to kind of wrap up on this, you know, yes or no, if we were to do what you suggest, um, consumers, individual consumers, the people we care about, the people, the moms and dads and brothers and sisters that we care about back home, they are going to see a positive impact from this if, if we do what you're suggesting. I cannot definitively say what the impact is. I believe it will be positive given the fact that most of the entities who benefit from the price correction are retail electric providers or municipal electric you know, co-ops. And, and, and your, your testimony is that they're going to turn around, they're going to pass that through the customer and... They may not back. be able to offer rates as low as they were before because now their costs are higher. Right. And so theoretically, you've got, you've, got, you've got one that's maybe not in as good a position as another, I'm talking about reps, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, maybe they're not in a position they're going to have to raise their rates, which may make them non-competitive. I mean, you know, they have others who maybe were better hedged. They made different risk management decisions that they're still going to be able to offer those really cheap rates. Everybody is getting a piece of this default uplift. I do not expect to have my rates stay the same. Yeah. Everybody has to have a piece of this okay. uplift. But, well, the market will determine that right as yeah. competitive market uh, so folks will have and will have that opportunity okay I, I want to walk through a few other things and so uh, to get a handle on the, this number and so you originally cited 16 was a number in your filing at the PC which uh, was billed uh, to be a 16 billion dollar billing area uh, so I want to I dissect this a little bit so what the 16 billion actually is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, is just basically, and I think you more or less said this earlier, is multiplying the total load served by the real-time market price, right? Correct. Okay. And so it doesn't really look at whether market participants were actually exposed at the real-time price. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, a municipally owned utility who served its customers using generation that it owns at actual cost may not have paid that price at all, right? That's correct. Okay. So the $16 billion just treats every megawatt of load served as if it's ultimately billed at $9,000. That's the market value of right. the air. Right. Which may or may not be the case. Which may or may on, not be the accounting uh, number. Ba correct. Based on exposure. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, please let the record reflect that Mr. Shaheen is here. Sorry about that. So again, uh, just to reiterate. It's just treating every megawatt of load the, the same, regardless if that's actually what the really, really was or the true exposure. Yeah, it's uh, the economic value. It's just and the economic it value. It's just what it potentially is worth at nine thousand dollars. Yeah, and we, you know we never represented. You know we um, even in our initial letter said that you know it, uh, costs are frequently significantly hedged and. Um, you know, most energy costs are hedged by load serving entities through bilateral contracts or generation. Right. So, so that number, the $16 billion, and I think by what you're telling me right now is that you agree that you, you never really indicated that reversing the prices uh, would save customers $16 billion. That was not my intention. Right. No. Are, are you even really submitting today at whatever that number is that's revised now is is prices that will ultimately saving save the customers. Market. It's saving the market $4.2 billion. Yeah, it's not saving customers necessarily. That's the market design we have is that customers are different from Right, the I get you, market. I get you. And you agree that reselling now under the proposal will not provide $16 billion refund to Texas consumers? Yes. Or reselling now doesn't necessarily provide $4.2 billion uh, to Texas consumers? I cannot say what consumers are going to get. Right, absolutely. So I, mean, I just want to be, i spend a little bit of time on this because I just want to be really clear. I, I feel like in a lot of the conversation and what people are hearing and seeing out there, and I certainly don't want the people of Texas to have unreal expectations that someone's sending them a check. You know, or they're somehow, this is this is coming to them. If, if they are, I want to know who the check's coming from. I'm, I, and so the only reason I'm pointing this out is I, I don't want folks to think that what we're debating here necessarily means that consumers benefit at all. Theoretically, would you agree? They may not benefit at all. They may not get a cent. If we 
move this money from one pocket to another, there's nothing that says that a single cent of that actually goes to the consumer. I can, it's going to help public power. Right. Public power is a little bit different, but we kind of walk through that a little bit. That's a cent. I mean, that's right. a billion yeah, cents. That's right. That's <laughs> a billion, but there's a majority of that that, where does it go? Well, the majority of load in Texas is served by competitive retailers, so the most most of that money is going to go to competitive retailers, and all of it, some of it will go to marketers, and maybe even some of it will go to generators. It'll go to a number of types of entities. Right. And, you know, even with these lower numbers that you've now provided, you still don't know right 100% um, market participants' actual positions and whether they may have bilateral forward contracts set or outside their ERCOT settlement, right? The ones that they report to ERCOT, we can see, but the ones that they do not, no. So, because of the actual exposure, it could potentially be different even from the second estimate, right? Agreed. All right, so we could get another letter later, right? I do not intend to send any additional oh, okay. letters. Okay, because it's not necessarily information you you would have access to. No, and it's competitively sensitive information. Right, right. And even those lower numbers do not directly uh, they don't correlate to price refunds for residential customers. We've kind of gone over that again, but again, they don't necessarily translate to that. So That's each individual rep on what. So really, don't have a number for how much money, if any, would be would go back to residential customers if if there was a resettlement. Yeah, this is the wholesale electric market. Right, right. Do you um, let's switch a little gears a little bit? Do you agree that market participants respond to posted prices? Yes. Um, I mean, that's kind of the whole scarcity price and competitive market thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so would you agree that market participants may have taken actions in response to the prices that will now be undermined by changing the prices after the fact? So I don't, again, the way that the price intervention was effectuated, the dispatch price stays the same. So I want to be clear on that. And to the extent they have these other fixed costs, I mentioned startup costs, if they want to come to ERCOT and... Um, do a RUC settlement for those. We don't oppose that in case there were startup costs that were not recovered. Yeah. Well, let me, let me kind of ask a different way. So, for example, would you agree that people may have gone out and bought really high gas, like high prices of gas, to produce power that now could be at a loss if this changed? Because they were making that decision based on $9,000. So if they did that, they should have reflected that in their offer. Okay. Then the offer, the dispatch offer would reflect that. Okay. Um, I know we've all been watching various hearings on both sides and, you know, trying to, because we, we want to know more here. And so, and I want to ask you about something I heard in, in some previous testimony where there seemed to be this view that no one would actually be put in a lost position. It was, you know, I seem to hear people talking about, well, you got these people over here that made a lot of money and these people over here lost a lot of money. And so what we're really doing here is we're just, we don't think it's appropriate to Mr. Raymond's point order for you to make, you know, a number ten billion dollars uh, but we think it's okay five billion so you're still making money we're just gonna let you make less and that's somehow gonna lessen the blow over here but that's not well first of all it is that your position do you, th do you think that's that's what happens here so if I on on the hours that were in question the initial settlement based on those inflated prices people were paid too much and so a result of a price correction would be getting some of that back. Mm -hmm. And the majority, if you look at the net position, the majority are folks that, um, you know, had a lot of money paid out to them in the original settlement and now will have less. Yeah. Well, my, my point in this question is, as, uh, again, these are things that are out there and people believe that this is just an issue of fairness and we're like, you know, you shouldn't have this windfall. We're going to let you make a little bit of money, but you shouldn't have this windfall, and, and we're going to move some of that over here to make sure some of these folks that got hurt not get hurt as bad. And and it isn't it possible that an entity, you know, maybe broke even considering their ancillary services uh, revenues, for example, might end up in a loss position if we reprice ancillary services. The majority are the former, but there there are a few that right. could be. So the, they're, correct. there are winners today, if you will. Yes. that wouldn't just win less, they would actually be flipped from winners to losers, right? It's a zero-sum game, right? There's, there's, there's a pot of money here. And, it, and, and so it's just moving it from, from somewhere. It's coming from somewhere, right? Uh, you know, what about someone who was able to essentially break even as a result of, uh, and I won't use the acronyms of RDPA, but reliability, so I'll spell it out, reliability deployment price adder payments that were received those payments from providing reserves on Thursday <laughs> yeah. and Friday. Uh, if you substantially reduce that payments, could it cause someone to flip in that case? 
So respectfully, we don't make um, our recommendations based on winners and losers. Um, we look at what the economic under the fundamental economic principles are, and because of the inflated price on that day, people were paid far too much for reserves. And again, like I said, we had a lot of it, a lot more than we typically would, and so those payments were very large. And I don't think they were accurate or uh, appropriate. All right. Um, moving on to the pricing a little bit, so. I'm would you agree that only really a portion of electricity transactions on a given day in our account are transacted through the real-time market? The real-time market, yes. Right. Some are on 80, you know. So 80 market participants contract around the real-time prices and other external markets. The real-time price, everything is based on the real-time prices. Um, futures markets are derived from them, and that's what drives uh, long-term behavior. But uh, most people hedge ahead, and um, there's a smaller than 100% is you know, on the whole, the real-time market, it changes. Yeah. Would you agree, I, I know ERCOT had previously indicated that 80 to 90 percent of transactions are outside the ERCOT settlement process. Do you agree with that? 80 to 90 percent are not um, exposed to the spot price, the ERCOT spot price. Um, and, and given that that's the case, you know, if real-time market prices were changed after the fact, but and we're going to have ICE up here later as well, and so they can speak to a lot of this, but, mm -hmm. but market participants have already settled up in those external markets, mm -hmm. like ICE, for example. Uh, could they be left with trap costs as they can't get back, and they can't get back from a counterparty? Yeah, so that's what I mentioned before, is that we understand there are, <laughs> there are there's good points to be made on that side. Um, we still come down on the other side of whether or not to do the price correction, but since so much time has passed, I understand that those markets have settled and it does create downstream impact. Okay. So resettling on those on the ERCOT real-time market with no ability to resettle on the bilateral or forward markets um, could leave market participants who did their business correctly with, with an obligation to pay ERCOT money that maybe they cannot now get their back their, their money from counterparties, right? I oversee the ERCOT wholesale market, and I believe that the commission order was not followed, and I'm making this recommendation knowing that there are reasons to do it and reasons not to do it. We happen to come down the side that we believe it's the right thing to do to, do, to make the correction. Right, right. And we're going to get some testimony from us later, so I'm, I'm, I'll leave a lot of those questions to that. And so uh, just a couple more, and um, I'll see if anyone else wants one before we go. But um, so who, if we do this, Ms. Bivens, who gets helped and who gets hurt? Like, help break it, like, make it simple for us. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not an attorney, you're not an attorney. There's, you know, all this legal stuff and everything. I'm just in the radio business. So, uh, help me understand who, who gets hurt and uh, who gets helped in this situation. Net buyers of energy are helped. Right. And that money comes from net sellers. Right. So, is it possible uh, in that situation? So, would you agree with this statement? We, if we did this, we, we could have some folks who uh, maybe have been before us and we praise them for what a wonderful job they did. They did everything we asked them to do. They made good decisions in advance. They managed risk properly. They secured uh, fuel supplies. They did uh, everything right and they showed up. When we were asking them to show up, they showed up. Um, and so we're thankful for those folks. With what you're, you're proposing here, is it possible, and in fact, is it very likely that someone like that is now asked to give us some money out of their pocket and give it to someone who maybe didn't make the same decisions. Maybe they didn't manage their risk as well. Maybe go down the list, kind of the same thing I just said. This person over here did all these things right that we praised them for and they were prepared and they winterized and they, you know, whatever. That we would take money from that pocket and give it to someone who maybe didn't make as good of decisions. Is that potential there? Yeah, that money should not have been put in their pocket in the first place. No, I didn't ask you that. I'm, I'm saying, is that, because uh, we're talking about what you're proposing to do. And, and what I want to understand is if that's going, if that has the potential, in fact, the, the probability of happening, that we will take it from good actors, folks who did everything we asked them to do, they were there, and we're going to now punish them at the expense of. Or, or to help people who didn't make us make the same decision. I don't see it as a punishment, but the money will come from net sellers. Well, I bet they do. Net buyers. <laughs> I bet they would see that as a punishment. And I bet, that, I bet I would look at that and say, "Well, wow, what's so much for this showing up thing?" So, you know. Well, there's the rest of the week. 
um, but I, I, I would I, there, there's I also the default uplift I don't want you know there's a lot of folks who are not able to pay right. those bills at ERCOT, and to the extent you can reduce the default uplift, that's going to help everybody, generators and Right, but you're going to have the same conversation then, too, because you're going to have folks, I mean, take in the co-op world, for example. You start talking about that and even talking about the uplift stuff, you're going to have folks that are happy and the folks that are not happy because the same thing I just described, right? They're going to say, man, we did it right, we did everything, we, yeah, and maybe even as a co-op, maybe our members decided to have a little bit more security. They actually decided over time they would pay a little bit more for electricity, for that reliability and, and that to lessen that exposure. And now we're going to get hit for people who didn't make that same decision? Yeah, default uplift is necessary but bad. Right. I understand. But Absolutely. can you see how someone would think that was incredibly unfair? Absolutely. And if I'm, a, I'm following a board of a co-op somewhere that's in that position, and I answer to the people, I mean, you're close. I mean, these are these are member-owned folks, that, and they're saying, "Wait a minute, guys. You know, we I thought you said if we, you know, we paid a little bit more and we did these things and we made these investments, that you know we would be protected. That you know we, that we wouldn't have the same level of exposure as maybe someone else has. And now we're going to go back and say, "Sorry, these guys over here didn't. They didn't do that." And you need to pay for their sins. It happens, right? Will happen. It will happen. Yes. All right. Anyone else have questions for Ms. Bivens? Uh, Mr. Hunter. So you said net buyers will gain. Let's name names. Who are the gainers? That's competitively sen sensitive information to for me for me and my position to disclose. So we got based on my contract. So we have gainers, their secret, and the public pays the bill. Correct. What do you mean by the public pays the bill? Well, you told me a while ago that the ultimate payor are the rate payers. So I'm just asking your quote, the net buyers gain. The net buyers gain. It's and you told me that you can't tell us who the gainers are, but the public is the ultimate payor. I know who they are and I'm, I, just don't know that I have the authority. I am a lawyer. I don't know how to reduce information. I am a lawyer. Information. If you can't tell us, mm -hmm. check with somebody. <laughs> but what you're telling me in front of the public is you don't know whether you can tell this committee, this chairman, and everybody in the world that's listening. It's retail providers. It's municipals and cooperatives, and um, some marketers, some banks. But you don't want to go into the details. I'm afraid that I don't think I have the right to reduce, to reveal financial information under my contract. So again, I'm correct. Net buyers gain. Net buyers. The gainers. You're in a position you can't disclose and the ultimate bill is paid by the consumer. I can Correct? Tell you, I can tell you, yes, I can tell you the types. That's all I need. Oh. Bottom line on what, everything I've heard, I've heard 40 billion, 16 billion, 4 billion, 5.1 billion. The billions seem to be moving all over the place. Now, the bottom line that I'm hearing, and I understand your wholesale, but I appreciated when you gave the reference to you as a homeowner. So here is a block in Texas. One side of the street, the lights got to stay on. The other side were turned off. And now what you're telling us is both sides of the street got to pay. Correct? That's possible. No credit those folks were turned off three, four, five days, correct? Well, they don't pay for energy on those days, but there's no direct credit. They were off when they paid the bills, 
and you're telling us logically they're now going to get a bill. Correct? Time will tell. Correct. Time will tell. That's my answer. We do not know how those dollars are going to flow. And I'm, I'm sorry. But Didn't you tell me earlier that you believe the ultimate payor would be the That's problem. who buys energy, our so consumers. So the public will pay. You don't want to say yes or no. I, it's genuinely not my area of expertise. I'm a wholesale market expert. But you gave me that example as a homeowner. So don't you really believe we're all going to pay? I think my bills might go up. There you go. That's all I have. Chair recognizes Mr. Raymond. Um, you know, I read in the clips this morning that <clears throat> I guess they determined 57 people died during that freeze in the state of Texas. 57. Um, their survivors, are, if we don't do anything, their survivors, even if we do something, by the way, their survivors are going to pay higher utility rates. Um, I, don't I don't know how anyone can dispute that. But I very much appreciate your testimony because one of the things that the press out there has not written about much, if they've written about it at all, and, and we really hadn't talked about it, is when I asked you uh, the entire period of time that they were, these, you know, $9,000 uh, per megawatt hour was allowed to be billed because of a governmental action, PUC slash ERCOT. The bill is $46 billion. We're not even disputing the $30 billion, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I appreciate everyone's questions up here. I respect all my colleagues, and I really do. Um, but we're not even talking about touching the $30 billion. We're saying, hey, the $30 billion, you're going to get that, right? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Don't, don't say mm-hmm. Say yes. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the $30 billion. Now, for me personally, I think that they shouldn't have been allowed to charge that much, right? We could have done something else, but be it as it may, they took a governmental action, which is legal, in quotations, and so $46 billion. And all we're talking about is the 16, which has now been turned into 4.2 billion. We're not even talking about the $30 billion. And it, it just it, it doesn't make it through my brain when we're sitting here worried that if we pass the Senate bill and the governor signs it, that some, oh, these poor, these poor guys out there, the 30 billion that they were guaranteed, that wasn't enough. They're gonna be winners and losers. They're gonna be losers. They get to keep 30 billion. We're not even talking about the 30 billion, and we're sitting here. Oh, those poor guys. They're going to be losers. 4.2 billion. I'm sorry. I'm getting excited. I don't mean to get excited, Chairman. It's just little folks get hit all the time. They're going to get hit, Mr. Chairman, with a 30 billion dollar bill, and we're not even talking about doing anything about that at all. We're contemplating whether or not we should pull them back on the $4.2 billion. That, that's what we're talking about, right? That's correct. And with all due respect, when your response to the chairman, when he says, can you guarantee that, that they, they, the consumers, were we to pass legislation, would get the $4.2, you said, no, I can't, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Can you guarantee if we pass legislation that they will not? get that over time? Yes. You can't guarantee either way, right? It could go, they may get the credit. I believe that they would in the end because if we don't do anything, you know, the Koch brothers aren't going to come and donate $4.2 billion or George Soros is going to not going to, you know, Bill Gates. They're not going to, nobody's going to donate that $4.2 billion. Everybody's going to pay for it. And we're sitting up here, we can afford it. We can get by just fine. But there's so many folks, we keep forgetting that we've been in a COVID pandemic for a year. So many folks that have taken so many hits and now we're going to give them, we're, they're going to get that $30 billion electricity tax. Who's going to pay the $30 billion? Who do you think is going to pay the $30 billion, by the way? Consumers, right? At the end of the day. Is it likely or is it possible consumers will pay the $30 billion? 
Retail electric providers, municipals, and co-ops. And who do they sell it to? And they sell to the retail. Okay, so they're going to pay the 30 billion, and we're talking about should we pull it back 4.2? Not the 30, the 30 there, but the 4.2. That's what's in question here. Is that correct? Just those two days. Thank you, and I apologize, Chairman and members. I, you know, it's just in Laredo. I don't know about you all, but in Laredo, I've got a lot of poor folks, and and their electricity bills matter. And a lot of them didn't have electricity, to, to Mr. Hunter's point. And they're still going to have to pay for the $30 billion, and they're still going to have to pay for the 16 or 4.2, whatever it is, at the end of the day. They're still going to have to pay for it. And that's why I apologize, Chairman, I, you know, but, but people have taken a hard hit for over a year, and this is going to make it harder. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Um, we're going to have to recess to go to the floor. Uh, and just to be clear, we sometimes forget that there are pu the public's out there watching and they don't understand uh, some of these terms sometimes. Your, your answer a moment ago says the net buyers would benefit. And so, uh, just so the public knows here, net buyers are those folks who had to go, they, they couldn't show up, and so they had to go out on the market and buy, right? It just means they're short electricity, whether they were short because their generator failed right. or because their load right. was higher than theirs. There's a number of reasons that can happen, or just because of their trades. Right. Could be the way they managed their risk. Could be that they didn't winterize and they were frozen up, or they didn't secure fuel source. Or, There's know, a number of reasons. Number of reasons why, reasons why they, they weren't able to show up, so they had to go on the market, right? So that's that's what you're talking about with net buyers. All right. Ms. Bivens, thank you for being here today. We appreciate your testimony. All right, members, we have to go to the floor, so without objection to the committee, we will recess until the final adjournment or recess of the House today or during the period authorized for reading and referral of bills if permission is granted by the House.